so we know what we're talking about. D-O-N-M-Y. Here we go. We're talking about general equity. Look up the look up courts of chancery, and they're saying there are courts of general equity. Mm -hmm. It says there are courts of general equity. If I got it here, New Jersey. Let's see here. That ain't in that one. It's in New Jersey courts of chancery, but we, we're gonna move on from that one. Let's go back to where I was. Theonomy. Theonomy. Theonomy from theos means God and nomos means law. Now here you go see, it's a hypothetical Christian form. Now this Christian form they're talking about goes back to the first century. <laughs> That's the hypothetical Christian faith, the abstract Christian faith, the invisible Christian church. Yep. All right. That says that in, it's a hypothetical Christian form of government in which society is ruled by divine law. Now we know that under, as we said, according to the Westminster faith, it said that that law has been dissolved and now it moved to general equity. Right? And general equity is chancery law. How yep. we know it, let's look at it. It says that the precise definition of the enemy is a starting presumption that the old covenant judicial laws given to Israel have not been abrogated. Therefore, all civil governments are morally obligated to enforce them, including specific penalties. And furthermore, that all civil governments must be framed from coercion in areas where scriptures have not prescribed their intervention. The regulative principles of the state. Note that the enemy is distinct from the anonymous ethnics proposed by Paul. Let's look, see what Thomas Aquinas had, had to say about it. Thomas Aquinas held that if a sovereign were to order these judicial precepts to be observed in his kingdom, he would not sin. Some have mistakenly referred to this as general equity theonomy. General equity theonomy. So look up general equity. Just <laughs> look that up. <clears throat> What does Jim Rapidly mean? What does general equity mean? As a ceremonial law was concerned with God, the politics of concern with the neighbor. Two, in those matters on which it is in harmony with the moral law and with ordinary justice, it is binding upon us. Three, in those matters which were peculiar to the law, peculiar to that law and were prescribed for the promised land or the situation of the Jewish state, it has no more force for us than the law for foreign, the laws of foreign commonwealth. You hear that? <laughs> so that's what Jim Eckley means that, uh, where's that? Let me find a better definition. Means collectively the general class, no, that's not it. You know, they have to create their own colorful definitions as well. In general equity, uh, the enemy, a confessional and biblical doctrine. There you see the uh, hammer of justice. Mm -hmm. In general equity, the enemy, a confessional and biblical doctrine. Some of those who identify as the anonymous today refer to themselves as general equity, the anonymous, believing that this identification lands them within the boundaries of a reformed confessional or or orthodoxy. But if it does, then the term general equity needs to be defined the same way as traditional define it. The technical term general equity is used in the both Westminster Confession and the second London Baptist Confession. So you see that? The confession of faith defines general equity as a law of God. 
And we know that equity is the law of chancery and the law of chancery headed by the Lord Chancellor, which deals with conscientious law, which is the natural law of what? God. So they took it away from the natural law of God and gave you a spook law. How do we know that? Let's go back to Westminster Confession. Westminster of Confession Faith. Uh, Westminster Confession Faith is a reformed confession of the faith drawn up by 1646 Westminster Assembly as part of the Westminster Standard to be confession of the Church of England, to be the confession of the Church of England. Now we know the Church of England goes back to the reformation of the House of Tudors, right? House of Tudors, that brings you here, Solomon Act. Seventeen Act of Settlement Act of seventeen oh one. History. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Let's see here. Just go. Where is it at? Come on along. At the same. I think it was a plantation act. Let me just find it. And what you looking for? Uh, the plantation act. Okay. Yeah, it's the plantation act. I got it. Give me one second. Plantation, plantation, 1740, all right, here we go. Very important. Plantation Act starts with an origin, if you go, if you scroll down. Oh, come on, my mouse messing up, all right. It had to be the Southern Act. I'm probably over there looking, over looking. Oh, here we go. Uh, Settlement Act of 1701. The Act of Parliament of England that passed in 1701 to settle the successions of the English and Irish pounds of Protestant only. This had the effect of disposing the descendant of Charles I, other than his Protestant granddaughter, Princess later Queen Anne, as the next Protestant in line to the throne was the Electress Sophia of Hanover. This is King George I's mother, a granddaughter of James VI in the, in the first of, of England. After, after her, the crown would descend only to her non-Catholic heirs, all right? And this was a result of the act of supremacy, yeah. as we can see in, 1558, and that resulted from the Act of Supremacy of Henry VIII of 1534. This all is the House of Tudors. All this is done by the House of Tudors. Little Mr. Ferguson and Henry VIII are from the House of Tudors, which resulted in what we call, what we just said, Well, again, we're talking about, all right, back to the oh, Westminster Abbey, yeah, right here. Okay, so the Westminster Confession of Faith was a reformed confession of faith drawn up in 1646, uh, uh, Westminster Assembly, as part of the Westminster Standard to be the confession of the Church of England. Now, the Church of England, as we can see, goes back to who? Henry VIII. Henry VIII, yep. <clears throat> Roman Catholic Church, 1534. The Supreme Act of 1534 by Henry VIII and 1558 by Queen Elizabeth I 
all it had to do with the uh, faith that was done under the Westminster Common Faith that was done in Westminster Abbey, as we're going to go back here now. So Westminster Confession of Faith was done in Westminster Assembly as part of the Westminster Standard to the big confession of the Church of England. Now we know the English Third Temple Church, which we are, is the restoration of the reformation of the Church of England that was reformed to the Protestant leaders such as King Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, King James I, King James II, uh, King Charles I, King Charles II, Queen Anne, on down to King George. All these were descendants from the reformation of the English Third Temple Church of England through what we call the uh, breakdown of the Yorkshire Lancaster's house of the, of the Plantagenet crowns or the Angibian crowns. So as we can see, that the faith that are now being practiced by these modern churches, I don't care what faith you practice, are a result of what was done by establishment of those uh, branches that were created through the Protestant and Anglican faith, which were the reformation of the Church of England established by the House of Tudors, all right? Now, when we're dealing with the Westminster Com Confession of Faith and the new standard of faith that will be in practice for the invisible churches, this originated from the visible church that was established back in the time of what you, they call 1 BC, which in the time of the Burberry year, the year 950, where King Edgar the Peaceful was running the church of uh, Westminster Abbey. Why? Because he's the one created the monastery bishops or the monks to run that church. How we know that? Let's mm -hmm. go back to Westminster Abbey. It says in 1643, the English Parliament, what's the English Parliament? Let me move this. Can they see that? Yep, the Parliament of England is pulling up now. All right. Come on. Why are you acting up? Come on. Just Mercury retrograde oh. start tomorrow. Yeah. Well, I don't need you. Wait one second. All right, here we go. Westminster Confession of Faith, as we said, was by the Church of England, right? Now it was said that uh, in 1643, the English Parliament called upon learned, godly, judicious divines to meet in Westminster Abbey. Listen to what this is saying, y'all. The English Parliament called upon learned, Godly and judicious divines. Judicious is with courts, judiciary. All right. The uh, divine people who act in a manner consistent with English Parliament. And English Parliament goes back to what? Back to the Magna Carta, 1215. Magna Carta. <clears throat> the Parliament of England legislator of the Kingdom of England uh, from the mid 13th to the 17th century. The first English Parliament was convened in 1215 with the creation of the signing of the Magna Carta, y'all. Do y'all see that? So when you go back to this reformation of that which is talked about the Magna Carta, you get into the Westminster Confession of Faith. Because it said in 1643, English Parliament, i.e. our house, called upon learned godly and judicious divine to meet at Westminster Abbey in order to provide advice to issue on issues of worship, doctrine, government and discipline of the Church of England, basically. That's the whole nutshell of the uh, establishment of this Westminster Common Faith to establish a way of worshiping according to the doctrine that will assist the government in disciplining of those who are a part of the English Church of England, as well as the Reformed Church of England. But how it got reformed was a result of the problem. Why? Because the original Westminster Abbey Abbey as established by English Parliament was subject to the origin or at where Westminster Abbey was established from. Let's go there. And this we'll close on. Read that from Archbishop. All right, it's loading up now. <clears throat> Westminster Abbey, <clears throat> formerly titled the Collegiate Church of St. Peter at Westminster is a large, mainly Gothic Abbey church in the city of Westminster, London, England, just to the west of the Palace of Westminster. It is one of the United Kingdom's most notable religious buildings. Scroll down. And the traditional place of coronation and a burial site for English, 
and later British monarchs. Now you heard that for later for English and then later British monarchs. Mm -hmm. So all the King James them were British monarchs. Why? Because they didn't let English colonies come here. They let British colonies come here. So you only let your, your your people from your mother country come. So they must have been from British descent. Mm -hmm. All right, be ready. The building itself was originally a Catholic Benedictine monastic church until the monastery was dissolved in 1539. Mm -hmm. Between 1540 and 1556, the abbey had the status of a cathedral and seat of the Catholic. What's going down? Oh, I'm sorry. In the seat of the Catholic bishop. After 1560, the building was no longer an abbey or a cathedral. After the Catholics had been driven out by King Henry VIII, having instead been granted the status of a church of England, royal peculiar, a church responsible directly to the sovereign by Queen Elizabeth I. Stop. Okay. So as we can see, under the Elizabeth Religious Settlement of 1701, do the English reform, do the uh, Supremacy Act of 1558 on Elizabeth I, that was preceded by the Supremacy Act of 1534 by her father, Henry VIII, who was, uh, who, who controlled or styled himself as advisor of the Church of England and Westminster Abbey that you're reading about, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're showing you that Henry VIII, instead being granted the status as a Church of England, Royal peculiar, a church responsible directly to the sovereign by Queen Elizabeth I. Now we know that this uh, it said it remained. It said the building itself was originally a Catholic Benedictine monastery church until the monastery was dissolved in 1539. This goes back to the House of Tudors. Mm -hmm. All right, because this is the, they're being at particular time. But it said it was a Benedictine monastery church. So it's very important, a Benedictine monastery church. Because this is going to bring us back to Westminster Abbey, which was the, created for the first Benedictine monastery. Let's go here to so the origin of Westminster Abbey. Read this part right here. Okay. It says Since the coronation. Uh, since the coronation of William the Conqueror in 1066, all coronations of English and British monarchs have occurred in Westminster Abbey. Six. Okay, stop. Stop right there. History. Very important. The guy said, Upon Peter, I build my church, right? Mm -hmm. History. Peter means rock. A late tradition claims that Aldrich, a young fisherman on the River Thames, had a vision of St. Peter near the site. This seems to have been quoted as the origin of the salmon that Thames fishermen offered to the Abbey in later years a custom still observed annually by the Fishmongers Company. The recorded origins of the Abbey date to the 960s or early 970s when St. Dunstan and King Edgar installed a community of Benedictine monks on the site. Read that again. It says, <laughs> the recording origins of the Abbey date to the 960s or early 970s when St. Dunstan and King Edgar installed a community of Benedictine monks on the site. Okay, so 950 is 1 AD and 1, B, 1 BC, 1 AD is 950 to 951 AD. And we know 960 is a couple of years short from 950. And this time we're talking about uh, Westminster Abbey under the, uh, who established Benedictine Monk Monastery under St. Dustin and King Edward the Peaceful, which we know is Jesus Christ. We already proved that, all right? Mm -hmm. Now we know that he set up a community of uh, Benedictine monks. What is the big time monk? <laughs> the black monks. Melanelli brothers. Yep. Read that. Gotta pull it on. All right, the Benedictines or Benedictines, officially the Order of St. Benedict, abbreviated the OSB, are a monastic religious order of the Catholic Church following the rule of St. Benedict. They are also sometimes called the black monks in reference to the color of their religious habits. They were founded right, by- cool. That's cool, all right. So the School of Black Monks, and that goes back to St. Dustin and King Edward the Peaceful, who instituted the School of Black Monks on the site at the first site of Westminster Abbey, where in 16th century, William the Con I mean, Henry VIII 
reform the tradition that was practiced in Westminster Abbey, going back to the school of black monks, set up by King Edgar the people in St. Dustin, who St. Dustin said was Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We're about to prove it. That this guy said that King Edgar the Jesus was Jesus Christ. But yet, you don't see him kneeling at King Edgar's feet. You see him kneeling at the abstract feet of the Jesus Christ and not this one. But yet, you can see this Dunson in line with the true Jesus Christ, who was no abstract king. It was the real king according to history. Because we're reading about the history of Westminster Abbey and not the false history established by the Westminster Book of Common Faith. All right? And we showed you King Edgar, the one who set up the monastery, standing on the world. Hell, exchequer chamber. Yep. All right? It says here, 1042, read what it says. It says between 1042 and 1052, King Edward the Confessor began rebuilding St. Peter's Abbey to provide himself with a royal burial church. It was the first church in England built in a Romanesque style. Okay, stop. Those who, we're not going to go into the later history because we can get into the, the uh, what we call the 39, what's it called? The 39 something uh, dealing with when the uh, usurpers took over. But what we're trying to do and establish here is that all your faith, worships, customs go back to the English Church of England, reformed by way of the House of Tudors and all those who succeeded from the House of Tudors by way of reformation. And as you can see, that our faith was not uh, abstract, but it was concrete faith mm -hmm. that we worship in lieu of that was set up by our ancestors and our king, known as King Edgar the Peaceful. Why? Because he set up what we call these, uh, Westminster Abbey under St. Dustin and King Edgar the Peaceful. Now let's look at who King Edgar the Peaceful is, just again, so you brothers to know. This is King Edgar the Peaceful, King of Albion, who I'm the reincarnation of. 959, he was born in 943 and died in 975. So one BC to one AD, one BC to one AD is talking about this guy right here. Because mm -hmm. it's the only person living at that time and Jesus was supposed to be uh, living at the time. So this is Jesus, how we know that. Let's prove it. Let's go to St. Dustin. He spills the beans. St. Dustin, 909 to 988, was an English bishop. He was, he was successfully abbot of Glastonbury Abbey, Bishop of Worcester, Bishop of London, and Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, if you look at the missing life of Jesus Christ, he said that he went over to Glastonbury, England. Mm -hmm. Glastonbury by his father, Joseph of Arrhythmia, took him by his body out the uh, cave and took him over to Glastonbury, England, where he grew up as a child, because Jesus never died. Meaning King Edgar never physically crucified. He died like, like each one, every one of us, of old age. Mm -hmm. All right? St. Dustin. Here you a picture of him. Now let's get a better picture of him. Let, let, let Jesus speak. Because if you associate St. Dustin with King Edgar the Peaceful, and you associate St. Dustin with Jesus Christ, then you automatically know that Jesus Christ is King Edgar the Peaceful. Because why would St. Dustin put a picture of Jesus Christ, him down, down at Jesus Christ's feet? But yet, they make mention of him through the English history of the medieval ages. Mm -hmm. That does not make any sense to me. Let me find it. Fantastic Jesus. There we go. Do y'all see that? Mm -hmm. You go to Jesus Christ, the, the abstract one, and there go Dunstan. Say <laughs> Dunstan, but yet, as we just read, uh, King Edgar the Peaceful instituted the Benedict Monastery with Dunstan there being at the head of it. So that means that the Roman Catholic St. Dunstan changed him because he's not worshiping the King Edgar the People. He worshiping this guy right here. Mm -hmm. 
So the proof is right there. And I got one more thing to show you. Uh, indisputable facts, y'all. How do I close that list? Oh, sweat. Hold on. Let me just go back there. The show shifted. Why is that allowing me to click back? Give me one second. That's good. Give me one second, brothers. Jesus. Images. What is what's important about this image is the date. One second, let me see if I can find it. Uh, all image. I'm pretty sure it says 950 if I could find it. Images. Let me share. Let's see if I can find it. It says 950 on this bad boy. Hold on, I know where it's at. I know where it's at. It was on Wikipedia. Let me go back at it. It was right on Wikipedia. Right in front of my face. All right, go to the last one. We ain't gonna hold y'all much longer, viewers. There we go. Dustin. Now look at the date here. Mm -hmm. We just said Westminster Abbey was instituted by King Edgar the People, and he instituted the Benedictine Monastery with St. Dustin as a, 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 a bishop. Possible, possible self-portrait of dust in detail from the Vastabury class of boat. Install, no, that's not it. Where is it at? It's one of these things had the date on it. Well, I ain't gonna find it. You, you guys can look through it on your own. And then you see it. You see uh, 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 Benedictine Monastery, or uh, St. Dustin, kneeling down as Jesus feet. All right, this is considered to be the son of man. But as you can see, based off the historical record, that's this St. Dustin is associated uh, with King Edgar the Peace for why? Because his date of existence, Dustin was not born in the time of one first century BC. Mm -hmm. That's how you know somebody lying. <laughs> Let's go back where you at, Dustin. Circa 908, 909. So he's living in the time of the Middle Ages. So living at the time of the Middle Ages. So what other proof do you have to be aware of who you truly are as being part of the English Third Temple Church of England, reformed from the English Church of England as a result of the reformation uh, that was done by imposters to now call it the Church of England. So you got to make sure what church you're a part of because church means body. Exactly. Body power. You know, what body are you part of? Are you the part of those denominations that we just told you <laughs> that were created in place of the original denomination, which is the English heirs and successors, worshiping the original saints and martyrs that stem back to the kings of Wessex under King Edgar the Peaceful, going back to Astroton and time and memorial. I got one more thing to show y'all how, how far our kingdom go back.
All those who think they know, you don't know. Y'all dispute this. Just tell me if y'all can dispute this fact. Prove to us King Vince's line about we ain't, we're not English heirs and successors. Prove to us, just based off this one. Prove to me 